Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello, everyone. I'm Nick Clarge, and welcome to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. Today is part two of vaginal bleeding in early pregnancy, and we're going to focus on ectopic pregnancy. The goal here is to give you some major pitfalls of diagnosing an ectopic pregnancy in the emergency department. We'll look at the importance of risk factors, the history and physical, as well as look at the diagnostic tools and some of the problems with them, and talk a little bit about treatment. Risk factors. Are they important? Textbooks tell us the classic risk factors are tubal ligation or other tubal surgery, a past history of ectopic, infertility treatment, PID, and current IUD use. But in reality, only 50% of patients will have the classic risk factors. The pitfall? Assuming low risk of ectopic pregnancy in a patient with no identifiable risk factors. Same applies to the signs and symptoms. The classic triad of abdominal pain, missed menses, and vaginal bleeding is not sensitive. Up to 25% lack the full triad, and 10% may have no symptoms, so don't rely on this. And always remember to consider ectopic when a patient presents with syncope and have a, has a positive beta. What about physical exam? The most common exam finding is abdominal tenderness, which is present in about 80 to 90%. There's also pelvic exam findings, such as adenexal tenderness, adenexal mass, or uterine enlargement. The patients can also have orthostasis. Remember though, the pelvic exam can also be completely normal. If you're looking at a patient and thinking the vitals are completely normal, so there's no way this patient can have a ruptured ectopic, think again. Vital signs may be falsely reassuring, and they can have normal vitals even with a liter or two of blood in their abdomen. They tend to get a reflex bradycardia that's caused by the vagal response to intraperitoneal blood. The pitfall? Assuming low risk of ruptured ectopic in a patient with normal vitals. Let's move on to the beta. I'm going to give you two pitfalls here. The traditional teaching is that a beta HCG level less than 1,000 rules out an ectopic pregnancy. It's wrong. There's no level of the beta HCG or series of betas at which an ectopic pregnancy can be ruled out. It can present with rising, falling, plateauing, or even a zero beta HCG level. Pitfall number one, ruling out ectopic pregnancy based on beta HCG level. The second pitfall we actually talked about in part one, but is that urine betas are unreliable and give false negatives in early pregnancy. Always obtain a serum value. Pitfall number two, relying on a urine beta in early pregnancy. Most of us are using bedside ultrasound to rule at ectopic pregnancy, and it works. It's been proven in the literature to be very specific. It involves looking for an intrauterine pregnancy and free fluid in the abdomen and pelvis. And there are four criteria you need to have in order to confirm an IUP by ultrasound. One, the presence of a gestational sac within the uterus. Two, a yolk sac or fetal pole within the gestational sac. Three, These structures must be within the uterus, so confirm bladder uterine juxtaposition. And four, ensure the myometrial mantle is greater or equal to eight millimeters. And why is this part important? It's because you can have a corneal ectopic pregnancy, which is when a fertilized ovum is in the section of the tube that is in the myometrium. It's rare, but it's often mistaken for an intrauterine pregnancy and can get much larger before becoming symptomatic. Always beware of a pseudogestational sac. It's identical to a gestational sac, but it contains no yolk sac. This occurs in ectopic pregnancy and can fool you. It's why we need to fulfill all of the criteria. The question you're asking is binary. Is there an IUP or not? There's no indeterminate. If it's an ND IUP or a non-definite intrauterine pregnancy, look for free fluid. Always consider heterotopic pregnancy, especially those who are unstable and an IUP is seen on ultrasound. It occurs in 1 in 30,000 pregnancies, and this rises to 1 in 100 if the patient receives fertility treatment. Let's quickly recap. Your patient has bleeding in the first trimester. You've done a history. There are no risk factors for ectopic. The pelvic exam is normal. The beta HCG level is less than 1,000, and the bedside ultrasound shows an ND IUP and no free fluid. Do we need to get a transvaginal ultrasound in the emergency department? The answer is yes. The pitfall here is foregoing or delaying a transvaginal ultrasound to rule it ectopic in a patient with first trimester bleeding or abdominal pain. There is no combination of history, physical, and beta that can rule it an ectopic. A lot of us won't be instituting treatment for an ectopic, but we got to know a thing or two so we can find out those pitfalls. 
Briefly, the treatment options are very similar to those for spontaneous abortions. There's expected management, which is for stable patients with a beta less than 200 and not increasing. There's also methotrexate, which is given for those patients with a beta less than 5,000, no fetal cardiac activity, and the ectopic mass is less than 3 to 4 centimeters. The patient also must be hemodynamically stable with no signs of rupture and are reliable to follow up. Then there's surgical management, which is for unstable patients, and patients who do not qualify for methotrexate or have already failed management. This can happen. You can have a patient who has an ectopic, they've been given methotrexate, and they come back with pain. Can we chalk it up to just side effects of methotrexate? The answer is no. This can indicate tubal rupture, which occurs in about 4% of patients and usually two weeks after methotrexate treatment. Patients need a full workup for ectopic rupture, such as hematocrit, beta, and an ultrasound to rule out bleeding. The pitfall here is assuming that a patient taking methotrexate for a known ectopic pregnancy presenting with abdominal pain has a low risk of rupture. So let's recap and hammer home some of those pesky pitfalls. One, assuming low risk ectopic pregnancy in a patient with no identifiable risk factors. Two, remember that the classic triad of abdominal pain, missed menses, and vaginal bleeding is not sensitive. Three, assuming a low risk of rupture of ectopic pregnancy based on normal vital signs. And four, ruling out ectopic pregnancy based on beta HCG levels or relying on a urine beta in early pregnancy. Six, foregoing or delaying a transvaginal ultrasound to rule out ectopic pregnancy based on history, physical, and beta in the symptomatic first trimester patient. And lastly, assuming that a patient taking methotrexate for a known ectopic pregnancy presenting with abdominal pain has a low risk for rupture. Thank you everyone for listening and see you again next time. Music